Uh, what we wanted to do today is give you some sense about what the Senate's going to be uh, doing with the budget, or at least procedurally, uh, how it's going to go. It begins today at uh, 3.30 when the LAO will be asked to formally present her report. And uh, a couple things that became pretty clear is that uh, she was uh, able to set priorities rather than take that across the board percentage cut that the governor did. And she also found it necessary to look at balancing uh, revenues with cuts. And although she did not, she had a couple of examples about fees, but she was also talking about, you know, closing loopholes. And we we tried that once so far this year with the yacht tax, and probably will give us some idea of the difficulties that lie ahead in <coughs> trying to get rid of some of those. But um, I think her approach was uh, a sound one at, and uh, structurally sound. Now we'll hear that, and uh, and then we'll begin. Uh, there's been some s uh, rumor coming out of the horseshoe that the governor wants to set up working groups, budget working groups, to take on the so-called big issues. Um, I thought that's why we had a budget committee. Uh, uh, but clearly, we're going to be doing in public, in the open, what um, maybe the governor has planned for behind closed doors. I mean, if the special interests want to testify, they can come and do it in public. So um, I'm not much interested in, in sitting down and using the big five in ways that uh, was never intended. If we're going to talk about education, we're going to talk about health care, uh, we're going to talk about flattening the organization. Whatever it is that we're going to talk about, we're going to do it in a full light of day so that we underscore the fact that we're talking about people's lives here. We're talking about people's careers. We, met, you know, we cannot be cavalier about that. And the last thing that we want to do is to uh, have somebody say, you did it in the dark of night because you didn't have the courage to do it in the light of day. Now, the governor prepares his budget in private. He doesn't have public hearings when he puts his budget together. Then he, as they say, proposes, and then we take it to dispose of it. And that's the way this place works. And uh, there's no shortcutting that. You know, we recognize that we only have 10 weeks between now and the time the May revise comes out, which may, in fact, change the, the contours of the earth as we know them right now. So... We have to do a job that has not been done before. And, and frankly, I know there's a lot of skepticism. You know, we've been saying that Chicken Little was right for 25 years. And at the last minute, we always managed to get out of town alive, as my predecessor used to say. We've always managed to survive, or at least apparently so. In, in that survival, we've now almost become last in the nation in education which is incredibly, not, incredibly hard to believe, uh, you know, for someone that spent some earlier years with a real job teaching in the classroom. So we've got to do this in a way that is uh, uh, comfortable with the, the mandate that we have. Now, the one thing we are doing, we're going to have as many, we're going to have the, the committee in chief will meet at least once a week and that is to look at the major issues. Because one of the inadvertent results of having budget subcommittees is that you create issue silos where you, you are able to talk about Medicare or Medi-Cal as though it had nothing to do with what was going on in education or child care. And so the major issues that we are having to confront now, education, health care, the services that protect those unable to protect themselves, that has to be done in the open. And it's got to be done together so that we talk about it in the context of the entire budget. And we saw something happen when we did it earlier this year when we tried to pare down a little bit our current budget year. We had Republicans asking questions about podiatry and the, the, uh, the lack of having podiatry services available to the elderly and the overall cost that we might uh, incur, incur if we don't do that kind of thing. And we talked about, you know, they talked about other things that I am sure if you sat on the subcommittee, that sub four that only dealt with 
government structure or prisons, you'd have never had an opportunity to see. So when I said on the floor a couple of weeks ago that I was encouraged by the work done so far, uh, I am. Uh, and we are blessed that Denise Duchenne has the ability to master uh, a lot of the language and subject matter. So she was able to direct people back and forth. And she also has given the Republicans full opportunity to engage. You know, you go into that subcommittee uh, at the uh, descriptions that go on there, and it's always a two to, two to zero, two to one vote. Well, we expect the committee to make decisions. You know, if we're going to be doing certain things that are going to require a change for the way we've done things in the past, we're going to take a vote and then have staff go off and work on it and bring it back. And this is how the action that you just took would look if we did it in reality. So there's a lot of work to do, and as you know, if you've been around this place at all, Everybody's got their own bill package. That's the most important thing that's going on. So this, in many instances, has always been done as sort of a, an extracurricular activity. Now we've moved it into sit on center stage, front and center, and whatever else we do around here will pale by comparison. And we've also said that before, and I'll let you know how that works out. But you won't see a lot of bills going into appropriations and coming out. Uh, if it's going to cost money, you know, we're not going to spend money on new programs when we can't keep the ones that we have. We're going to evaluate everything that we're doing and see if it can be done better. Or should the, we be more conscious of not spending money there and going into direct services? You know, it's fair to say that our caucus is united on a, on a, a general view. You know, children didn't get us into this mess, and we're not going to, you know, make the children... We're not going to punish children to get us out. You know, they're entitled to an education. They're entitled to opportunities. They're entitled to a childhood. And so we're not going to make education uh, and other children's services the basis upon which we balance this budget. So I'm looking forward in some ways to this because I think since I've been in Sacramento, this is poten potentially would be the first honest year that we're going to have uh, discussions about the budget. Because, you know, cutting $7 billion out of the state budget is not something that most of us can figure out how to do without having us become sort of an economic also-ran. You can't tout the, the economy of this state and the achievements of California in, in tech, in academia, in biotech, and then turn around and, and savage the very institutions that have built that that economy. And we expect everybody to be engaged in this. Uh, you know, the special interest can come up and say, not, you know, don't, don't cut us, but we're going to make everybody engaged because everything that we do will have an effect on everything else. And I know the governor likes to call uh, democratic special interests things that are, are, you know, ours, like teachers and child care workers, and then uh, his or stakeholders. But um, anybody that's got a horse in the race is going to have to ride this thing from the beginning to the end. And we're making that challenge. And just saying no is not going to be good enough. And I think we've already discovered that. We've got the, you know, we've gotten a little taste of what it's like. And none of us like it. Nobody comes to Sacramento. No one comes up here to cut things, to make things less than they were when you got here. Forget about legacy. That's just human nature. It doesn't like that. But we also, not one of us, was drafted to be in the Senate or in the Assembly or on the first floor. We all volunteered. We said we wanted to lead, so that's what we're going to have to do. Together, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to provide the leadership that's going to take California to where it needs to go from a place that, frankly, someone like me never thought we'd be. So with that, Denise, you want to... Uh... <laughs> no, only to just um, acknowledge and thank Senator Parada for, for recognizing this process and how important um, this budget really is. Um, I, I know that some of you have been around since 91. I wasn't here then. But since that, 91, 92, 1891 for Ed. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you know, there hasn't been a, a situation uh, as complicated. And a lot of the things that were done to get out of that were undone by the end of the decade. Um, but we saw ourselves come back on the economic side. And I think w one of the other pieces we have to sort of keep in mind is where does the economy 
uh, of California go. As, as Senator Parada said, it, it you know, where, how did we get to here and how do we get to be the economy that we are? And a lot of that was built on our education system, uh, on our higher education system. Uh, and, and we've got to kind of look at this in a, in a larger context. And that's part of the, the object of sort of having full budget committee hearings, which we did find um, an interesting success in, in the current year discussions, um, to have the full committee there, to have more members participating, particularly more Republican members. Um, to have more people understanding all of the different pieces because oftentimes we've sort of le left this and all of a sudden it may revise and in conference suddenly we start trying to put pieces back together. Um, this one is so severe that if we don't do it from the beginning, um, most of us don't think we can get there uh, at all. Um, we obviously need to be fiscally responsible, but I think just like the LAO, we want to set priorities. Um, we we want to look at, at what's a useful organization or a program. Uh, and what's not as useful, what, what will focus um, our attention on direct services uh, and direct classrooms um, and the important things. Uh, and and we've got to set those priorities and decide what they are and then try to work our way out of saying, well, if this isn't an essential service, if it's not part of the core, uh, then, then where, how can we get whatever needs to be done done in another fashion? So, you know, it's on us to look at business practices of the state, um, to look at uh, you know, anything that's duplicative and, you know, we've talked about it a lot, but I don't think the urgency was there um, for all of our members to appreciate that now is the time when, yeah, and the administration too has to step up to the plate and look inside um, their own departments and not just say to them, do an exercise of 10%, what does that mean? Um, we don't know that some departments couldn't cut 50% without harming uh, essential services because they weren't asked to do that. Uh, we don't know that some maybe really do need the full workload budget in order to accomplish something that otherwise will cost us a lot of money in the long run to make up for. Uh, and we've got to now do the work to try to sort through that uh, and find, you know, what really matters and, and what are the priorities uh, that we as a legislature want to set. During the next 10 weeks, we'll try to have as much public discussion um, as we can, both in subcommittee and in full committee, uh, and hopefully you know, people will buy lots of things between now and May Revise. With that $600 they're going to get back from the feds or something, I don't know, and maybe the governor's going to come home with a plane full of federal money. That would certainly be welcome. Uh, but at the moment, uh, you know, we've got to deal with what we've got, and we've got to understand the program so that when we get to those final decisions in May and June, uh, we are in a position to say, you know, we have looked for everything. We have done everything we can think of to, to reform our business practices. We all know we have to constrain. Uh, and now, you know, how do we fund and, and what is our commitment to funding what's necessary to keep the economy of California moving? I kind of gather from your remarks here, both of you, that in this phase, between now and May at least, you're not going to be looking at new revenues. You're simply going to deal with the revenue stream as it is. Is that yeah. correct? Why not? Right. Why, I mean, how, how, how do you make decisions about spending without considering revenues, which I assume that you would like to uh, pursue? In some well, it's. Uh, uh, when we talk about the order of magnitude, I finally realized what that might mean. Uh, in education, the governor is going to have to whack $4.4 billion out. That's, that's what he is proposing. And so before we can propose an alternative to that, it's important for us to understand what he's, uh, what's hanging in the balance. And um, on March 15th, when the pink slips go out, or the letters go out in the school districts, there will be uh, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of teachers, probably tens of thousands, who will be put on notice that they may well not have a job uh, next year. Uh, that's going to have a huge effect because in order to, if you were just going to take it out of the classroom, you could lose 67,000 teachers. Now, it's harder for anybody to grasp that, but that's it. Or you could have, if you're a parent, you might have to figure out, now what am I going to do my, with my child between Labor Day and, and the 2nd of October because the school year is going to have to start 30 days later or classroom sizes will have to be, you know, there'll have to be five more kids in every classroom in order to balance out what we, we're going to lose. So for us, it's important to be very clear on what the governor's proposing and the outcome of those proposals. And then we can make some decisions. Is that the path we want to go? Will we end up like Mississippi and Arkansas or will we choose to go another path? And I don't think until we do that, people are going to have the appetite. Because, I, you know, we've, for too many years, people have said, 
you know, nothing would get, uh, would get better uh, but for there to be some more money. And I don't think the public's buying that right now. People, middle class families are stretched. Everybody's not on, people don't stop me in the street and say, you know, geez, I don't pay enough. Everybody knows that uh, it's uh, hard to live in California. It's an expensive state to live. And people, before you can make a case that they ought to spend any more or pay their fair share, you're going to have to make the case. Don, in the end, uh, the list of tax credits and tax breaks that Liz Hill talks about, is that going to be part of the solution, do you believe, or is it dead on arrival? Well, no. It's, it, everything will be part of the solution that we can make it. But again, I'm, you know, I'm not as optimistic today as I was uh, two weeks ago because I thought that getting rid of the yacht tax would have been, you know, just a day at the beach. And uh, the Senate mixed metaphor. The Senate, uh, the Senate did vote for it. And then, it, you know, it, uh, the Republicans in the Assembly had a hard time figuring out whether or not this was really something they wanted to do. And it was, you know, it's one thing. It's, some, it's only $26 million. Well, it's the poster child, for crying out loud. You know, we are protecting yacht owners, uh, and however you want to dice it, you're protecting yacht owners who, best I can tell, probably have seven-figure incomes. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, the governor wants to deny kids food, literally, or immunizations, or any number of things. So, yeah, everything is going to be there, but if you can't do something that obvious, I mean, that was like right down the middle of the plate at 70 miles an hour. You can't hit that, you don't belong in a game. I'm now switching metaphors to sports metaphors now. You're assuming this is going to be a cuts-only budget? No. What we're, he gave us a cuts-only budget. So what we're going to do is analyze what, what that means. What would the state of California look like if we chose to say this is a spending problem, not a revenue problem? And I, you know, I've said to somebody that that sounds good and that's a nice sound stage uh, thing, the way to look at life. It ain't the real world. But I also believe that the skeptics out there, and there are many of them, and they're also the ones that pay the bills, they have to be shown what does this mean. I don't think the governor, candidly, understands what, he's, uh, what kind of California he wants us to have. It is completely and diametrically opposed to what he said out on the steps when he took over from Gray Davis. There he said he wanted to restore California as the golden dream. The ideal, you know, I've said, he didn't go to Arkansas, he came here, California. And he wanted California, he wants to restore California. Well, this is not a restoration budget. This is an eve of destruction budget. And so we've got to make that case first before, uh, and I don't know, maybe there's some really good things that he's got in there, you know, but I, across the board, 10% cut, you don't, you wouldn't run your budget that way at home. Trip to Hawaii is going to be 10%. They'll have 10% less gasoline. Sounds like you're doing kind of a Washington Monument budget there. And a Washington Monument budget, you're going to highlight the negative impacts of what the governor wants to do. But that doesn't sound like you're actually producing an alternative to what the governor wants to do. Well, I mean, in order to produce that alternative, just as the LAO has produced an alternative to the governor's budget, okay, she, she looked at it, came up with a whole different scenario. She... She found some, some tax credits to talk about. She did different fees than the governor did. The governor did fees. He doesn't call them taxes. He calls them fees. But some people who pay them would think they were something like a tax. Um, but, but the, the you know, he, he does some. She does different ones. It's an approach. So she came up with an alternative budget. For, for us to do that requires these kind of public hearings. I mean, I know school districts in my area are now having hearings and saying, what would we have to do if we had to meet this cut? What, what would we have to do? And, and I think we need some time. People keep expecting us to have a solution to this overnight. It, it's not as easy as that. And we need the counties and we need the cities and we need the schools to be thinking about what would you do? What can you do to make yourselves a, a skinnier, better reform? I mean, we just read this morning Vallejo's talking about bankruptcy. Um, what are the impacts of some of these proposals on, on those kinds of situations. I mean, I get letters every day from foster care parents telling me if we do the governor's 10% cut, they're not going to take foster kids anymore. I mean, what what happens to the county? How does the county respond? What happens with the, the you know, the corrections? Um, Liz has a, you know, the analyst has a totally different approach to the corrections issue than the governor. Um, I think there may actually be other alternatives that our subcommittee has been talking about for a couple of years, um, you know, that the department hasn't implemented yet. Unless we can get all of those things on the table, 
it's it's hard to then structure the alternative. So, you know, it's to understand, you know, what does this mean? Are we going to lose all our counselors? Do we lose all our nurses? Do we increase class size? I mean, what happens where at what level? Um, to understand what's the baseline that we're trying to get to and then, you know, hope that, that perhaps, although the likelihood at this point is that revenues will go down in May rather than up, um, one can always hope because it every once in a while somebody in Silicon Valley sells a bunch of stock and we're lucky. But I will say this, you know? there is definitely a difference in worldview between what the governor's offer in California and what, what we want from California. Is he serious? Is he serious? I, yeah, I, everything the governor does, uh, because he's the governor of this state, I take seriously. And, um, you know, I think we have to show to him why uh, what he's proposing is perhaps not as good a way to go as others might be, yes. Well, this is nothing new. You know, we took our famous plane trip with the governor three years ago this month uh, where we went back to Washington to get our money, and uh, we came back empty-handed. And um, I think going back to Washington and every so often pointing out that there's a disparity between what California deserves and what we get is not very effective. And so, uh, you know, it got headlines. It got you to ask the question today in, in this meeting. But um, that's, that's far too cosmetic for me. If we had a sustained effort uh, and uh, he were, you know, banging and banging and banging, let's face it, there's an election this year. Some people think that the Republican nominee has a chance to contest in California. Well, maybe they should be talking about how would the Republican president uh, help California in that regard. But if you just, you know, have a press conference, meet with a couple of mayors and a governor and say this is what we're going to do, I mean, to point out that we need to spend money on infrastructure is a little... You know, you don't have to take a plane ride for that. Senator, on, on school funding, which is, you know, like 40% of the general fund, the biggest single item, it sounds as if you're going to hold hearings on the governor's proposal, which is quite draconian. What are you going to do with the Ledge Allen's proposal, which uh, she says, you know, is would freeze funding, essentially give them the same amount of the, money? The, 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 it, sounds, it sounds like you're actually trying to focus on a big cut to generate to the... Uh, momentum for more money for school. Well, the, L the LAO, the LAO also uh, proposes a cut to education, and not nearly as large as the governor's, but nonetheless. So the LAO uh, offers a uh, an alternative budget to the governor, in effect, because he did the 10 percent, she'd prioritize. That's much more consistent with what we will be doing. But we're going to look at both, you know. I just can't stand here right now as a, you know, as a, you know, a professional teacher and as someone that's got kids and grandchildren to say that I want to live in a state or preside over any opportunity to make California better while we're whacking the hell out of uh, schools. I just don't see that. And not by schools, I mean from child care all the way up to the to the uh, research institutions. What last one? Uh, can I ask in terms of the, the timetable, I mean, you're talking about a lot of hearings, a lot of work ahead, and the, the governor has said, you know, don't wait for the new guys. We've got to get things going now. I mean, how do you foresee that? Well, basically, I'm offended by a comment like that which says that we got to get going now like we've been doing nothing. You know, he prepared his budget. He gave it to us. We worked like beavers to uh, come up with as best uh, we could to meet what he said we had to do, and we met it, and he gave us credit for that. But to somehow to assume that because we're not having working groups with stakeholders in the horseshoe that we're not doing our job is offensive. Our job is to dispose of that budget consistent with the principles that we believe Californians want for next year and the years thereafter. So uh, he can howl as long as he wants at the moon saying you're not doing enough. I'll tell you, it won't add one bulb of enlightenment to the process. So the best we can do right now is, and I, you know, I've encouraged him to do something he's been doing, and he probably thought of it on his own. He didn't need my help. But he's running around the state talking to people about putting Californians to work, using that bond money. That's good. He should go out and make California feel like we're going to be able to, to uh, meet the challenge and that we're, gonna, we're in a very difficult period of time. You don't have to minimize that. Californians know it. But that we're going to get through it and we're going to be better for having gone through it. That's what he's good at. That's what you want from a leader. That's what you want from the governor. You know, I could go around California and do that kind of stuff. And, you know, unless I got hit by a car, nobody even bothered to watch. 
So that's the job that I'm asking him to do. If he wants to come down and do this job, he ought to get elected from the district. What about Senator you? Parana, I'm still confused. You, it sounds like you could tell us right now what the state of California would look like with governor's cuts. Care to take the venture? Yeah, we would look like uh, we're somewhere between a first and a second uh, rate state. I mean, our economy, if we can't do any better than this in education and with our university system, we will not compete in the world economy. We won't have to worry about the ports of call because uh, they won't be, there won't be anything around here to spend on. I mean, that's, California is at a point right now where we have to decide. For the last 25 years, we wanted the golden life. We didn't want to pay for it. We've debt serviced it, and we're all guilty of that, Republicans and Democrats alike. Vallejo is going into the tank because they've been making decisions for years, like every other city and county in California, where if you want to provide police services and you don't have any money, you enhance the benefit package at the end when they retire. So we've been living on a credit card for a long time. And just going out and having a press conference and cutting an oversized card doesn't get it done. So we have to ask Californians, what's it going to take for us to get back with uh, why you're here? And are we prepared to make those sacrifices and those decisions? You know, and I believe the best way to do that is where everybody is, has a stake in this, because I believe everybody does. I think it's, you know, and I'm not a Pollyanna, but uh, I'm, people confuse that frequently with me. Uh, but I will say this. Um, there is an opportunity here for California to reassess and reengage that would never come our way unless there was this kind of a crisis. So I welcome it. And I would like to rather than having somebody tell me I'm not doing my job here on the second or third floor, that, you know, you do what you do best and uh, we'll do what we do best. We will not solve this problem just because the Democrats are in the majority. We have to have Republican support. And the governor is going to have to be able to provide that leadership to get that support. That's his job. I'm kind of confused. You're talking about the do painting the doomsday scenario in the hearings, and you were talking about potentially uh, saving 50% in some departments, looking for efficiencies, things like that. So which is it? Are you going to paint both. the doomsday or are you going to? It goes to Ed's question. Look, is it a $4 billion cut in education? Is it a $2 billion cut in education? Is it the $500 million that we've already done? What, what is it? And A, we need to understand what all those things mean and what, how much of a priority things are for us. Obviously, you want to use it, you want to make those decisions off of a base that's as lean as you can make it because we know there is less money than last year. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, so it's both of, you know, it, it, we have to understand what those things are uh, in order to make those decisions at the end.